All right, everyone. Well, uh, thank you for coming out. Like I said, it's hard to tell sometimes who comes out for these presentations, but this is the reality of game development, kind of a first step guide in understanding what it means to make video games for a living. And that is from a commercial that I think maybe, I think that's a little too old for everyone here other than me, because that was something that I saw back in the 90s about how to become a game designer. Just call up and you sit around playing video games all day and you become rich. It doesn't happen like that for real. <laughs> but uh, my name is Josh Beiser and I run the site and channel Game Wisdom. I've been talking about and covering game design now for more than six years. I've interviewed game developers literally all around the world at this point, from people just starting out to those who have established studios. My focus is more on game design rather than uh, game news. So uh, basically I talk about stuff like how to make a popular platformer, what goes into aesthetics of a video game, why do achievements work, that kind of thing. And I kind of occupy that niche between being between the consumer and the game developer. But uh, there's a lot to talk about here and we're going to be covering a few specific areas while ignoring some of the other ones. So we're going to be talking about kind of the first steps about getting the game industry, what it means to work at a major studio versus going on your own, as well as I'll have some books and journal websites that if you don't know about, these are some that are good to keep track of if you want to start learning game design and get into things like that. What we're not going to be covering, schools to go to, interview tips, resumes, stuff like that, and very importantly, a step-by-step -step guide to making a game and becoming rich. Because one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that those two things are very different. There are people who make lots of video games and they don't make a lot of money. Just as there are going to be some who make just one lucky game and it can hit it off, such as Minecraft, Five Nights at Freddy's, and everyone's favorite game right now, Fortnite, which is kind of taking over the world as we know it. I do love, like, how I'm recording this right now, so people watching this, like, the people in the audience are laughing at Fortnite. Like, depending upon, like, the audience, they are either loving Fortnite or they hate it. They, thank you. Thank you. Two, thumb, two thumbs down for people watching this for Corey right now. Oh, there we go. So, this presentation is kind of split between the good, the bad, and then the education. So this is the good part. Why this is the best time. The game industry, again, for you two in the audience right now, you, you're kind of on the younger side when it comes to playing video games. I understand that I've been doing this, or I've been playing video games since 1988. So that's a very long time for this industry. And when I was growing up, video games were pretty much the niche thing. It was a thing everybody made fun of. It was a thing that if it was on television, it would be the joke. You know, the nerd playing video games. Nobody's going to follow this stuff. Nobody really was thinking about education. And it wasn't until this last decade, or I'm sorry, in the thousands, that we started to see that big acceptance. And then this decade, it's gotten a lot bigger. I mean, colleges are offering not just esports courses but, or esports scholarships, they're offering game development courses. You're seeing the video game awards this past week. Did either of you watch the video game awards that was online? Uh, well, they, had, they have an annual video game awards at Stream, I think it's on TV. It's hosted by a man named uh, Jeff Keeley or Knightley. I always get his last name confused. And, it's getting to the point where video games are now pretty much accepted as not only a legitimate art medium, but as a way for someone to make a career out of. A, now, those two games listed down there, I'm sure uh, you've probably either played or have heard of. That's, of course, The Last of Us and Red Dead Redemption 2 that just came out a few weeks ago. Another big point is that being an independent developer, meaning you're on your own or with a small group of people, is now widely accepted as a another alternative to working at a major company. So the independent market has been a very big deal as to why it's become so much easier to make video games. Uh, do either of you play like independent games at all? I know you mentioned Undertale and uh, Shovel Knight. Anything else? There was a, on the Xbox store, they have a category called the Creators Collection. Mm -hmm. They have a whole bunch of independent uh, indie developer yeah. games on there. Mm -hmm. Do you play any any games? Um, I don't really have any idea. I'm not. 
I don't really like. I kind of just like. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how the best way to describe it, but I never really look into whether it's a duty okay. game or like a yeah. PC game. I'm not. I don't care yeah. about that. I care about the game being good. Yeah. I care about the game having like. It's something you want to play. Yeah, having enough to make me want to play it. Yeah. I do agree with him. I don't really pay attention yeah. to that stuff. I probably have played millions of independent Yeah, and the line has been becoming more and more blurred over this past decade. I mean, independent games started back in the early... We could actually say start back in the mid '90s. If you knew the if you knew the company, they were making games. There are developers such as uh, Spireweb Software. They're a small time when they make RPGs. They've been around since 1994. Uh, do either of you know the company or the game Serious Sam at all? Yeah, Serious Sam is done by a developer called Crow Team. They started out as an independent developer in Croatia, and this was mid '90s. They were kind of one of like the first ones to make like a Kind of a big push in terms of an independent game. And again, thanks to game engines becoming cheaper, the fact that we now have you know Skype, Discord, virtual offices, you can make a game with people that you don't have to even be in the same room, let alone the same continent. You can have I've spoken to people who it was literally like three guys, one's up in Canada, one's in Boston, I think another one was in like Scotland, and they were all making a video game together, and they're just using virtual offices to do it. And of course, digital distribution, again, Steam, Xbox Live, PSN. You can now sell a game and you don't need to worry about GameStop, Walmart, Target, and all those other places. And of course, here's a few examples of independent games. Fez is probably the most recognizable one on that list. And again, there are many, many more. The other two are some of my favorites. I've spoken to the developers of Renowned Explorers and Darkest Dungeon before. But Darkest Dungeon will be coming up later on. And, of course, mobile development. I mean, everybody here, I'm sure, has a... I saw it, we all have smartphones at this point. So, mobile games is a big deal. It is a big market. But I know I'm, you're shaking your head there. I'm sure, depending upon your own uh, preference, you may not like mobile games that much. They're okay. I just yeah. don't have a phone. Ah. Uh, I have a tablet. So oh, okay. They, they make a lot of uh, knockoff games, which is my problem with mobile games. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and like Flappy Bird, that got ripped off completely. Farmville, Clash of Clans. And but there's still serious money in there, and there are still developers trying to make it big there. It is easier to design a game, and again, you get a, a software developer's kid or Unity or whatever, you can start making a mobile game. Now, selling it is another matter that comes up later on. And of course, here are a few of the big ones. Again, I'm sure we all know what Angry Birds is at this point. I think we've all been uh, flooded by those advertisements until the end of time. <laughs> but when it comes to game development, there are a lot of different tracks. And one of the reasons why I say there is no step-by-step -step guide and there's no real way to pick a school is that everybody has their own set of skills. I've spoken to people who went to school and college for game development and then started making a game. I spoke to people who were in law, and one guy was actually an accountant who stopped one day and then he started to make a video game, and that's how he started his own company. So there really isn't a direct step to becoming a game developer. There are skills, that I'm going to show you on the next slide, that will kind of be a broad list of categories. Now, of course, earning that money to make a game is usually handled by the studio, if you get a publisher, such as, again, EA, Nintendo, Activision, pick any one of those, they will also help fund you that way, or you go for crowdfunding. Uh, do either of you know, like, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, those kinds of names? All right, not a problem. We'll talk about that one later on. And, of course, a big point, even the simplest games will take some time. A general rule for software development is that no matter how long you think it will take you, it will always take you more. Doesn't matter how easy you make your game, doesn't matter, even if you have the complete plan in your head, always give you more time. But when it comes to game development, we can basically split into three broad disciplines. You have design, you have programming, and you have aesthetics. And like I said, while it may seem simple right here, it is anything but. And these are just a small snippet of various skills and 
a broad categories of what goes into these. So if you're a game developer, you could understand level design. If you could also be the guy who comes up with these systems, how a game is played. There are game developers, there are game producers. You could be the writer of a game, writing the story. You could also be a programmer, learning how to use different engines like, or programming languages like C++, learning Unity, Unreal. You could even, there are programs out there who create their own game engine. That way they have 100% complete control over how the game is ran. You could be a musician, you could be an artist. There's different art styles. Again, there's so much. And at the top there, those are kind of soft skills that go more into kind of running the company rather than just making a game. And they're not that exciting, but they are very important. Now here's the big question I'm sure everybody has thought of at some point. Is there such a thing as a pure designer? Somebody who only understands game design and is maybe not a programmer or an artist? The answer to that is no. Game design is not something you can really put into words what it is. I've been trying to do this for now six years. I have a book that I've just written. I have a second one due out or I'm trying to finish up for March. And it's such a multi-faceted topic that many people still don't understand what makes a good game from a bad one. And because of that, it's not really something that you can just walk into a company like Nintendo and say, I'm a game designer, give me a team and $2 million and I'll make you a game. They're going to throw you out before you even get through the door. And typically, game design is usually paired with either a programming or an art background. And again, the screenshots down there are obviously from the various Mario games. And famously, Mario's game developer, Shigeru Miyamoto, is an artist. And that was kind of how he got his foot in the door. And then he was given the role of game director, and he worked on Donkey Kong, and that kind of set history off for him and his career. But it is becoming more understanding that design and understanding what game development is important. But again, like I said, for both of you here right now, if you want to get into game development, you will probably have to learn or at least understand one of the other tracks in order to be able to kind of talk to people and more importantly, understand why this game is working. Because we can sit here all day long and just talk about game design ideas. I could stop the clock here and I could spend like an hour detailing a game idea in my head, but it doesn't mean much if you don't understand how to program it or even just how the art will look. So, studio versus being an indie. And like I said, independent development was became an option really, we could argue maybe like the end of the last decade, but it's now become a serious option this decade. And like we were saying a few minutes ago, that line between what's considered indie and from a major studio is kind of being blurred due to the quality of games coming out. And the big point is that it comes down to a refined game versus a unique game. AAA companies have the money, the teams, and the technology to make very refined titles, but may not be as unique as you would find from a smaller team. Again, I have played so many games from like two to five person groups that it is staggering the amount of differences you'll find. But the real reason why you go into the independent side is that it's freedom. You can make whatever you want as an independent company. And many people who start major studios will say, I don't want to work for somebody else anymore. I want to do my own thing. And they will try and found their own company. Uh, working at a studio. Again, studios pick a major game and it is probably ran by employees in the dozens, sometimes in the hundreds, if we're talking about a major game like Assassin's Creed, Red Dead Redemption, where they'll have studios pretty much all around the world doing various aspects of that game. And that's when we get into the big books. These are games that can cost millions, sometimes even billions to make. And it takes a lot at this level. Now, of course, the reason why you do this is that this is where we get the big games, the ones that tend to last in everybody's mind. Now, I made this, this screenshot was from about a year ago when I made this presentation last, but we could easily replace these with Red Dead Redemption. We could place uh, Zelda with Mario Odyssey. We could even place Call of Duty uh, Black Ops 2 there with Call of Duty Black Ops 4. <laughs> That's just how things work there. But again, 
there's serious money being thrown around at these studios. But it's not without its downsides. If you're thinking about joining a major company and thinking you're going to be a, you know, a major uh, wave place or a trendsetter there, chances are you're not. Most people who work at a company who get called in are going to be called for a specific task. They may need someone to do a 3D level design, and that's it. You're not going to really have any input. They just want you to do a task and call a day. Only the leads pretty much have more of a direct control over that game. And even then, you also have to worry about what it means of being at these companies. And when you're talking about a major company, we're talking again, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars being thrown around for these games. If a game doesn't do as well as they've hoped, there's a good chance that studio could go under or they will let go of a lot of people. And even companies that are successful or look like they're successful can run into problem. Have either of you heard of Telltale Games with like The Walking Dead? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, if you missed the news, like about two months ago, the company just completely shattered. They went bankrupt. And pretty much a majority of the people were let go. They are uh, outsourcing The Walking Dead's final season to another company. And pretty much Telltale is beyond, you know, on death's door at this point. They are circling the drain there. They will probably not be coming back once The Walking Dead is done. And for a time, they were considered one of, like, the premier companies. Their games won multiple Game of the Year awards. Everybody heard of them. They even got the Minecraft license to do, like, their own uh, adventure game off of that. But it turns out there's a lot of mismatching going on behind the scenes. And unfortunately, it doesn't matter how good your game is if the money is not coming in. Then there are, of course, horror stories of being overworked. There, are, there have been more and more cases of people speaking about uh, poor working conditions, being forced to work 70, 80 hours a week on a single game without any overtime. This is more of the major companies that are trying to get these games done as quickly as possible or within a certain time frame. But the problem, of course, is that the more you put that pressure on employee, the more it's going to come back to hurt them. And there are people who have been completely burnt out after working on a game that they just leave the company and then they may just leave the industry completely because they don't want to ever do that again. And there was a bit of a uh, scuffle with Red Dead Redemption 2 with regards to overworking their employees and spending like 80 hour work weeks for the last six months to get the game done. And Unfortunately, without like a union or like employees kind of stepping up or speaking up about it, I don't know if it's going to be solved in the foreseeable future. But the final point there is probably the riskiest point, and that is if you're hired by a company to work on a game, it will usually be a part-time or a t contract job. I mean, they may need someone for six to eight months to finish a certain part of that game. When your time is up, you may not have a job there. They may just need those extra hands, and then they don't want to keep on extra 50 employees when they don't need that. They may need you back for another game, but in the meantime, you're kind of stuck without a job. And there have been many stories of people who have been called to a job on the West Coast. They move out there, they get a new home or a new apartment, they start uh, paying bills, the job ends, and they're left with nothing. They don't have any other job opportunities out there. And now they're stuck in a place where the cost of living is much higher. And that's, again, why many people have gone to independent development. Because you can do it wherever you want. You can do it however you want. Most independent developers are their own boss. You're not going to have a publisher breathing down your neck. You're not going to have people saying, we need you to spend an extra 30 hours this week to make this game. You can do it. Again, how you want to make it. I've spoken to people who do this part-time. Some of them will do it uh, as a full-time job. Some may do it like in between their other work, but they are free to make their own schedule. And again, the amount of creativity and the, art the artistic nature of these games cannot be undersell. And again, why so many people are having trouble uh, separating independent games from the AAA is a big part of that.
And again, here's a list of a few more notable names. And again, I could update this like every five to six months with just the sheer number of games coming out. But there are downsides. And this is when we started getting to kind of the uh, depressing or the bad part of the presentation. As an independent developer, it means that you are responsible for everything, including the money coming in. So if your game, if it's taking you two to five years to make a video game, somebody has to be uh, paying for that. You can't just be working on your own and not having any money coming in. Now, and that is why, again, so many go for part-time or doing like freelance work on the sides. For many people, they dream about hitting it big. Again, having your own Minecraft or your own Undertale. But most developers don't get that. And you're going to, you may have to make a living project to project. And that can be very scary for a lot of people. Even for established developers I've spoken to, it can be nerve wracking to not know whether or not this next game is going to help pay for their house or help pay the mortgage this month. And of course, another big point, the market is flooded. There are, at this point, between 25 to 30 games being released daily. And it's great for consumers, it's great for us being able to buy all these games. It's not great when you're trying to make a living off of that. And that's why, well, this may be the best time, it's also the worst time. Besides the market, with all these games being released, it means that it's getting hard to put a value on these games. I'm sure both of you, you've probably bought games on sale. Again, uh, do either of you use like Steam at all? Okay. I'm sure with Xbox Live, they must have had a big holiday sale or a big Black Friday, that. Yeah, so there are sales going on seasonal. We just had one for the PC side on the platform Steam. I'm sure we're gonna have one just in time for like the end of the year or a Christmas sale. And this is how most of us buy our games because I couldn't buy, you know, 15, 20 games at $60 a pop. I'll be even more broke in a very short time. So I can get games for like between like $10 and less these days if you get them on the right sale. But because of that, when I buy a game at $4 or $5, that developer is not going to be earning a whole lot back. And it's getting to the point where developers are putting more into these games, but they're not getting as much out of it. Unless, of course, your game gets picked up by somebody like Markiplier or PewDiePie or anything like that and you get a huge boost in terms of uh, advertising and awareness on that front. Because of that, discoverability is a big point. And this is one of the more interesting terms. It's simply the idea of how easy it is for people to find you and your game. And unless you're actually making a video game right now, this isn't you know, life or death stuff you need to know about, but it is something to keep in the back of your mind. Because a lot of developers will think, I can just make a game for five years, I don't tell anyone about it, I'll put it up on a store and I'll get, you know, 20,000 copies sold in a day. It doesn't work like that. You need to understand, in order to succeed, the idea of like PR, you know, having a website, uh, being social on Twitter, Facebook, you name it. You need people to know that you're out there making a game or your game's not going to get sold. And then the other scary point, the idea behind the race to the bomb. We mentioned, of course, like free-to-play games, mobile games earlier. And people are playing a lot of games that are quote-unquote free before they hit you with, you know, $100 of microtransactions and, you know, buy all these gems. It's a, yeah, buy, the, buy a $700 of gems for only $299. But mobile games has been a very big point about getting more people to play games. But it's also meant that a lot of people are now being conditioned to say that I can just buy or get this game for free. Why should I give you $19.99 or $10 or even $5? And it's forcing people to lower their games uh, in terms of their price. But at the same time, you can't make a great game cheap. Some of the best games out there take two to five years, maybe even more than that, to get out. And if you're trying to cut corners like that, it's just going to come back to hurt your game. There is a game release I'll show a slide of in a few minutes called Cuphead. Either of you heard of that game? Cuphead's been in development, or was in development, for a good four to five years. And they'll be coming up later on, so I don't want to spend too much time on them now. 
there we go, hit the wrong thing. And because of that, it becomes very hard to make a living off of your video games. There are many people who make games, they put them up on small sites like uh, Congregate, what's another one I'm trying to think of? Armor Games? Yeah, Armor Games. And there's several other ones out there. Shockwave used to be big for a time when I was growing up. I don't know if they're still around. But there are many free games out there. But being able to make a game that you can put a price tag on that people will buy is another matter entirely. And at the end of the day, again, the money has to come somewhere. And if you're taking money from a publisher, such as they will give you, let's say, $150,000 to work on this game for six months to a year, you need to earn that money back before you are given anything else in terms of profit. Because they're not going to say, here's $150,000, and then you don't have to pay us back. That's not going to happen. And like I said, even the tiniest, smallest games you can think of can balloon up in terms of what you want to do. And there are many people get caught in that trap of, I'm going to make a simple platformer. But wait, I'm going to make this a role-playing game next. Ooh, let me throw in multiplayer on top of that. Oh, but we can't just have multiplayer. Let's do a completely new art engine. And all this work I'm going to do will make this game better. But again, if you took your two to six month project and turned to a three to five year one and nobody buys it, you are going to be in some trouble there. And sadly, I've spoken to developers who have been knocked out of this industry. They made a game and it did not go well for them and they were forced to leave. Uh, there's a developer I spoke to out in, I think he was in China or Taiwan. He made his first game. It didn't do well enough in the time, and the bank actually foreclosed on his company. And his game is now basically owned by the bank, and they now get all the uh, ad revenue from that game. But he is basically done in the game industry because it just didn't do well enough. And there's a big difference between doing this for a living and just making games on the side. Like I said, there are some developers who do hit big. I'm sure both of you know what Five Nights at Freddy's is at this point. That game took the developer, Scott Cawthorn, he's been making games now for over 20 years. But most people only know him for that one game because that's the one that hit big. And you can't just count on one game hitting it big and then you can retire for the rest of your life. There are two developers I've spoken to. They go by Cliff Harris and Jake Burgett. Uh, they're out in the UK. They've been in the industry for over 15 years. They don't make like very mainstream games, but they do make enough that they can have a living. Chances are they're not going to be making the next Minecraft or Fortnite in the foreseeable future, but they know how to make a game that stays within their budget so that they're not betting everything on that one game succeeding. And that second point is very scary. Because again, for you two in here, you've, you see games on XPLA, you've seen them on Target, you know, on all the major game sites and stuff like that. Games that do manage to succeed. But for every game that does, there are so many more that don't. And there are games out there that most people will never e ever heard of or will ever hear from because the game failed and nobody played it and now that company is out. And unfortunately, it's a very scary time. And that takes me to this lovely little motto that being successful takes more than just making good video games. And a lot of people, I know that sounds very hokey, but there are plenty of independent developers and students who don't understand that. They think, I'm just going to make a great game and everything else is going to you know, fall into place for me. It doesn't work like that. There's more to it than just understanding programming or art or being able to build a platformer. And these are just some of the missing elements that a lot of people don't understand. Again, being able to be sociable, being able to talk to people, being able to go out there and get in touch with someone saying, hey, I'm making a video game, would you like to check it out? Having people play test your game, managing a team, that's one that I think a lot of people tend to not understand. A lot of people get into this thing and I'm just going to make a game with my friends. We're just going to joke around for like a year. You have to be on the ball about this. And the game down there, that again is from The Darkest Dungeon. And the reason why I keep bringing them up is that uh, the company that made this, Red Hook Games, 
they basically did everything right in terms of getting the appeal for this game. The game was in Kick, uh, Kickstarter, again, I'll talk about crowdfunding in a few minutes, about, this was, I think, 2015, 2016, thereabout. And while that was the first time I heard about them, they were busy making videos and concept trailers and talking to people a year before that. And then when that was finished, they put the game up on Steam on their early access program. It's basically a way of playing a game while it's in development. And they were getting feedback, they were testing the game, they were balancing it. And it came out pretty much like almost like 8 to 9% perfect, which is a miracle when it comes to software development. And it's now on the Switch. It's, yep. Uh, with the advertising, mm -hmm. YouTube has been advertising its YouTube ads mm -hmm. where you put out ads for yeah. your small company mm -hmm. or uh, something like that. Yep, yeah. and Facebook too has that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have ways you can base it up so they, you sell the amount of funding you want, give them per month, and they'll put up ads and they'll guarantee you that X amount of people will watch it or see that ad. But while that is an option, it is important for successful developers to be able to do that on their own. And like I said, with Darkest Dungeon, a lot of people will only know of that game because they saw it on the Switch store or on the PSN or whatever. They don't know about the years they spend managing this game, trying to build up the marketing around it. And it's very easy to think that it's, it succeeded because it's a great game. But the reality is that it succeeded in spite of it being a great game. That if they didn't do anywhere near the same amount of marketing, most people would not have heard about it. And then they weren't going to succeed. And that takes me to this lovely point, failure. Like I said, not every game that gets made is going to be successful, let alone even break even. I have spoken to a developer who sold literally like 10 to 15 copies of their game, and that's it. And that is not good. You do not run a company on 10 people buying your video game. And then there are some people who go in and they get hundreds of thousands of sales, and it can go really well. But on the flip side, it can go really bad. And you have to understand how to mitigate that risk. Again, understanding that maybe I shouldn't spend 10 years of my life working on a game that nobody's ever heard of, and then just hoping and praying that somebody will notice it, and then they'll do all the marketing for me. And being able to survive means never going all in. That is, again, I'm going to bet my house, all the money I ever own, and I'm going to make this one game. Because it, it could work. And that's why I brought up Cuphead right there. Cuphead, like I said, was developed by a studio called Studio MDHR. And they've been working on this game for a good four to five years. It's been mentioned on various websites. It was building up buzz. And the whole like MO of this game is that it's all made in kind of like that, not stop motion, but like that hand-drawn animation. You saw like cartoons, like Looney Tunes or the old Disney stuff. It's done entirely in that animation, so it's all hand-drawn. Uh, it's like basically mirroring those cartoons, and that takes a lot of time. And they were picked up by Microsoft, and I think it was 2016, maybe 2015. And when they did that, the company took out a second mortgage on their home to try and basically make this game the exact vision of this game that they wanted. And it worked for them. I mean, the game won many Game of the Year awards. Everybody knows about this game right now, but it couldn't. Or it, there was a possibility that it couldn't work out. And if it didn't, they would be basically homeless. And again, it's one of those very weird things because the industry is very much hit-driven. Again, you two know what Red Dead Redemption 2 is. You know what Fortnite is. These are games that earn a lot of money. But you don't hear about the games that don't. You don't hear about games that fail or don't manage to break even. And it's important to understand that if you want to seriously get into it or get into the game industry. But uh, with that said, though, we get out kind of the depressing part of the presentation. And it's time for, to learn about what you can start doing now. And like I said, this is the best time because 
it is legitimate. You can go to a school or go to a library or go anywhere where there's education and they will probably be developing some kind of game design or game industry related stuff. When I was ta in college back in 20, uh, 2004, 2005, there was no game development courses at all. They were actually planning on phasing out their computer programming section after my class was going to graduate. And then I found out two years later that they changed their mind that they have a full game design program at the college. And in the ultimate irony, I'm actually speaking with them to possibly put on a lecture there in the springtime with my book as well. So again, you never know. That's the craziest thing. But the big thing you can do is to start figuring out what you want to do. So I guess for either of you, have, have you started thinking about like wanting to get into the game industry or wanting to build a video game? Yeah. And yeah, I think every kid who's picked up Mario or played any video game has thought about it. And the earlier you can start thinking about what you want to do and start finding out what you can do is going to ultimately help you. Like for myself, I didn't start thinking about things until college. I took a program, actually I took an art course first and I was horrible at art. You will never see any drawings from me anymore. I am terrible at art. I've seen kindergartners who draw better than me. And then I tried programming and it just didn't work. And I realized I was more on the design side of things and then I started doing more with writing, with podcasting, presenting, and that's kind of how I'm finding my own weird and unique slice in terms of the game industry. But again, the earlier you do it, it's going to make things easier for you because you don't want to be trying to figure this stuff out you know, when you're 35, 40 years old and you're trying to, you know, keep your house <laughs> afloat at the same time. So this is where we get to the fun stuff. There are multiple game engines out now that you can literally go home right now and download them and start working with them. And they are powerful, they are legitimate, and you can start doing something with them. Now, obviously, is your first game going to, you know, beat Minecraft? No. I don't think anybody's first game. But you can start doing stuff now and start getting your feet wet there. And if it, you do make something simple, I'm going to show you a few websites that you can try to upload or sell your game on. And who knows, you may get people interested or maybe even start building up a portfolio that you can start to show people in the future. So the first one, and I, like I said, I'm recording this presentation right now. I have a few of my programmer fans who when you say Unity, they kind of wince because of how popular it's become. But Unity right now is kind of the standard for a lot of people in terms of game development engines. It is entirely free if you want to download this right now. If you want to make a video game or sell your game, you may have to buy like the quote unquote uh, business or professional version, or you can just play a little splash logo that says made with Unity. I guess. A question for both of you. Have you played any games that have that logo? Like I saw it says Made with Unity. Yeah. No. What game did you play, if you remember? I can't remember. I have played so many mm -hmm. games that have said Made mm -hmm. with Unity. Uh, ones from uh, the App Store, mm -hmm. ones just on random sites. Yep. Yep. And that's because they went with the, I guess, the quote unquote, the cheap option. That if you don't pay for like the extra money or the extra version, then they just simply require that splash screen, excuse me, when you load up the game. There are a lot of people who don't like Unity because it's been attached to so many titles, but there are plenty of amazing games that use Unity for it. And again, the reason why it's so popular is that you can make almost anything with it. You want to make a 2D game, a 3D game, a first person shooter, a open world uh, survival game, you know, whatever you want, Unity can probably handle it for you. And again, it comes with so much of that stuff right in the box for you. And you can also download stuff from uh, the app. I, think it's, I don't think it's called the App Store, but they have like a, as, at the Asset Store. You can download like assets other people made. You can tweak things. And again, this is a legitimate engine. And you can download it. I have it on my computer, although the best thing I was able to make was a red square moving left to right that you hit space bar and jumps up. That was my uh, a grand magnum opus of a video game. But again, you can do this. 
Now the downside about Unity is that this is a real engine. Like you have to understand programming, you have to understand texture modeling, and it does take a lot of work. And there are tutorials out there, there's books, there's stuff on Unity's website, there are many YouTubers who have made, you know, how to get started in Unity videos, you name it. But the point is, you're going to have to learn this if you want to start making something with it. You can't just download and go, you know, two days later, I have a game ready to be uploaded. If you want something on the easier side, there is Game Maker. Do either of you know what Game Maker is? Okay. Game Maker is the, it's a simpler engine than Unity. It does not require as much in terms of programming. It uses kind of like a visual nature. So you attach um, elements to various properties that give like a jump or a movement or, you know, shoot a projectile. That projectile you can set does three points of damage. It's not as powerful as Unity, but it does not require a strong programming background. Again, the basic version of it is free. I think there are more powerful and expensive versions of it. But again, there are people who get this engine and they can make a video game with it. Have either of you heard of the game? Oh, this is good. I can't even remember the game that I'm trying to reference. That's good. Oh no, this is great. It's a, uh, I think it was called a Gunpoint. It was a game where you play as a little detective who like jumps like really far. It was released a few years ago. And yeah, that's a good, that's, that's a really good point again about how hard it is to make a video game. So many games come out that it's easy to forget which ones you've played. It will probably come to me like 20 minutes after this presentation is over. I'll be, you know, back in my, I'll be in an Uber on the way back and then it will come to me like out of nowhere. But uh, they made Game and Game Maker. Uh, they also made, mm, again, so many games in my head right now that the encyclopedia is flooded. But many people have used Game Maker. There are smaller games. Do you have a question or? Mm -hmm. For a little while, you made a game. Mm -hmm. You wanted to switch to Unity because you wanted more of a yeah. challenge, maybe a little bit more of a mm -hmm. range. Would you, could you use your knowledge from Game Maker on Unity, or would you have to learn like the Unity language? You would probably need to do some more learning. It's not really a, a Unity language, quote unquote. It is actual programming languages like C++. JavaScript, C Sharp, and you don't know what those are. Those are actual programming languages. Like people build stuff in those languages, you know, for commercial or for video game development like that. And you will need to learn that. But programming is one of those things that if you start, if you have the mind for it, you have the skills for it, it's a lot easier for you to adapt. It will take you some time, but if you start understanding how programming works and can build stuff in that, it will be a lot easier than somebody who has never touched programming, jumping right into Unity, and then trying to understand that at the same time. And a lot of people who have gone into the game industry that way have a programming background to begin with, and then they go into using an engine. Like they don't learn the programming and the engine at the same time. They may learn the programming first, or at least enough to start understanding it, and then they'll start getting a Unity or in a Game Maker. But again, with Game Maker, you don't really need that huge focus. Now, if you want, like the complete opposite end of the pool is the Unreal Engine. Unreal is the big daddy. This is probably one of the most powerful engines on the market today. It is used by many big name companies. It is powerful and it is, like I said, this is the big one. If you can learn this, if you can go home right now, download this engine and start figuring it out, you are going to be seriously ahead of the game compared to anybody else. The downside is that it is its own unique beast. Like if you're going to learn Unreal, you are learning Unreal kind of thing. Like you can still have that programming background, but they use their own unique elements for it. And it will take you a lot. It may take you some time depending upon how well you are. But like I say, if you can figure out Unreal and can make something with that, even if you have no intention of making a video game with that, 
you could definitely put that on like a resume or portfolio saying I can at least do something in this engine. And you can also sell your games that you make on Unreal. I believe they're now saying that they will only take 12% for any kind of sale that you make on the Unreal Engine or using it. So they're not going to kill you in terms of taking your money if you use the Unreal. But like I said, if you're going to learn it, good luck. And now, like I said, uh, flipping back the other 180 degrees, we have something like RPG Maker. And this is a weird engine. This is an engine that is only really meant for RPG games. And we're talking like 8 to 16 bit. So like old school Final Fantasy, uh, Dragon Warrior. I can start uh, randomly naming games. Breath of Fire, if anyone's ever heard of that one from back in the day. Like this is not the engine you are going to use to make a first person shooter. This engine does not work like that. But it, because it is a commercial engine, I mean you have to pay for it, it is probably the easiest for you to learn. I don't think there really is any programming whatsoever. You just use all these stock assets in the game and you just assign value. So you make your fireball do 20 points of damage. You make your, this monster hit for 10 points and you know, type that in, load it up and you have your RPG. The big point though is that it can be pricey. What they do is that the basic version, I think it's like 20 to $40. You may be able to find it on sale a few times, but then they sell all these assets separate. So do you want pirates in your game? Well, there's a pirate pack for $10. Do you want um, orchestral music? Well, that's a $5 pack. Would you like zombies in your game? Well, that's $6. And it can start to add up. And again, because it is so limited, it means that you, you can be spending a lot of money on something that you may not get a lot of value out of. Yep. So, like the 20 or $30, is that for like the year? Is that a one-time payment? That is a, that is a one-time payment. That is you oh. buying the program itself and the basic kit. They do put out additional versions. I think they're up to like the, I think I own like the 10th or 11th iteration of it, but they usually do a new one like every few years that they add more functionality, they make it a little bit better, stuff like that. But it is probably the least, I guess, quote unquote, programmy engine out there because it is designed for anyone. And there are plenty of people who use this to make smaller games. I don't know if you've ever heard of this game, From the Earth to the Moon. This was like an independent game that came out, I think, five, six years ago. It's like very emotional, very story driven. Yes, I, one of the YouTube channels I watched mm -hmm. had it. I didn't really watch the playlist, mm -hmm. but yes, I've heard of that. Yeah, that it's was emotional. Yeah, eight bit, mm -hmm. sixteen bit. I, I think it was more sixteen, but yeah, that was me an RPG maker. So, so it's kind of like playing with Minecraft. You play, you know, you yeah. make the map with all the blocks. Yeah. You assign the properties, and boom, you have your adventure map. Yeah. Pretty much like that. And again, people have used this to make games. Obviously, you're not going to be making like a $60 to $70 game with RPG Maker. But again, if you want to get your feet wet with something very simple or you really, really like RPGs, I mean, there is an, this is an engine that's literally made for you then. But no matter what you do, it's a very important to understand that it's better to fail small than is to fail on a five to six year project. Again, many people who get in the game industry think, I'm gonna make my first video game, it's gonna be the best game ever, I will spend 10 years of my life on this game, and everyone will buy it, and then it fails. And they're kind of left there holding a very big bill. Like I said, when you're first starting out, your game is gonna suck. It, it, it just is. Nobody's first game is going to be the next Mario. And it takes that iteration, it takes being able to understand what works and what didn't and grow from there. Like I said, with Five Nights at Freddy's developer, he's been making games for over 20 years. So if he's had that background of games that have failed and he's taken that knowledge and applied it to his next game, to his next game. And we repeat it until you get that one game. But even then, even if your game or a small idea has failed, you can learn from that. You can start taking the lessons you learned from programming it to make your next game better or make it quicker. 
I've spoken to developers who spend like two to three years on a small game when they didn't really have that understanding of programming. And then when it was all done, they said, you know what? If I want to make that game now, I could probably do it in like half the time because my knowledge of programming has grown so much. So it's important when you're starting out to start like testing the wars in terms of understanding what you can and can't do and start finding people who can also help you. Because the days of, or the idea of having the mythical super developer, the guy who is the best programmer, artist, and designer, all making a game by themselves, doesn't really happen. There are some people out there who can do that, but they are few and far between. So if you're really good at programming, but you can't do art to save your life, then try to find a good artist. If you're an artist who can't program, there are programmers out there. And being able to, again, figure out what you can and can't do is a good way to start growing. So uh, we're going to be wrapping things up in the next few minutes, but I want to go over some of the important places and terms you should know about when it comes to learning about game development versus just learning about video games, because there is a difference. And one thing I have a one of my uh, followers on YouTube, he's building his first game in college right now, and he said like the very same thing that I said here, that once you start learning about game design, you're going to find that most video game sites aren't going to interest you anymore. Because most sites only cover things from the consumer point of view, they don't really cover the industry or the business. So, like IGN, Polygon, Kotaku, stuff like that, they are not really the best places if you want to learn about what's going on with the game industry or what's going on with game developers. That's kind of how I built up my own little niche with game wisdom as well. But when it comes to understanding where to go or some of the important terms, this is one again that I brought up a few times during this presentation, but the concept of crowdfunding. This is something that kind of hit big, at least in the video game side in 2013, and it's kind of waxed and waned after that. The concept is you go on these platforms and you say, I have a game idea, you know, I have this, this, and this done, but I need X amount of money if I want to finish it, would you support me? And if people want to, they'll pledge money. And with Kickstarter, what happens is that if you hit your pledge amount, you get it. So if you ask for $50,000 in, let's say, 60 days or 48 days, and you get that, when all is said and done, you're going to be walking out of there with that money minus any processing fees. I think Kickstarter takes a certain cut of that. But you now have the money that you said you can make this video game. And this has become a legitimate and, for some cases, very successful way to make a game. Uh, Darkest Dungeon, like I said earlier, they got their money. I've seen Kickstarters that have earned in the millions in terms of getting a game funded. Um, if you've heard of the studio Double Fine, they did the game Psychonauts, they did a Broken Age, that was their Kickstarter game. They earned, I think, at least, I think, two to three million dollars on Kickstarter when they went on. So it is a legitimate option. And it's still going strong today. Fig is a weird one. You can actually buy stock in the video game instead of getting like little rewards from the company. You can basically say, I'm going to give you $20,000 to fund this game, but now I own like 2% of this video game. And there are people, I've had a few friends of mine say that they have funded a game like that, and they've actually earned money because the game did so well that they get a percentage of that game. It is crazy out there. That's the, it's one of those very strange stories. But these are options for people who, again, they don't have a publisher, or they don't have the money, but they have a great idea. And there is a lot of work that goes into a successful Kickstarter or crowdfunding campaign. That's another hour, hour and a half talk. And I think my voice may not last that long. But it's time for storefronts. And this is, again, where you'll be going to sell your game. Um, again, you two mentioned XBLA, PSN, the Switch Store. Those are more on the console side, even uh, uh, the Apple Store, Google Play, stuff like that for mobile. But there are many storefronts out there. And these are ways for independent developers to make money. So Steam. So do either of you know what Steam is? Yes. Have you bought any games from Steam? Uh, no, 
Mm-hmm. My friend got me uh, a game a while back. Mm-hmm. Okay. No. Yeah, so Steam is the big one. This is the biggest digital store for PC games. Company Valve, they used to make a game excuse me, called Half-Life, and then they made Team Fortress. And when they got Steam working, they are now one of the most powerful companies in the world. They have earned, I like to say, they've just earned infinity dollars at this point. We, don't, we may never know how much money they have actually earned from Steam, but it is probably inc- uncalculable for a lot of us in terms of how much. But they are the king right now. They have been the king since about 2007, 2008. And for a long time, they were considered the magic ticket or the golden ticket. You get your game on Steam, and it will do well. But with so many people now making games, the store has also been flooded. And it's why a lot of people have been trying to find the quote-unquote Steam killer. But there really hasn't been, because Steam has just earned so much goodwill from, develop- from consumers that nobody wants to switch. You get your game on Steam, you get a integrated friends list, they handle multiplayer, downloading. It's basically just all in one. And so many people, including myself here, we don't want to go back to the days of having to hunt down patches and, you know, games off of some random site somewhere. And it's just become a it's become a way of life for a lot of PC gamers. So and again, if you want to go the mobile route, you have the App Store, you have Google Play. Now, you have to submit your games to those stores, and they can decline you, or they will require you to keep the game updated to stay on there. Steam really doesn't care. as They have a new thing now called Steam Direct, where you give them $100, your game's on the store. It doesn't matter what your game is. It doesn't matter whatever your, how much time you spend on it. You give them $100, you have a store listing on Steam. But again, it's why a lot of people have felt that Steam has been devalued over these last few years. Now, another big example is GOG. Now, GOG, this is a weird one. I've, I've talked to people who know what the store is, they've heard about it, they love it, and then there are people who have never heard of the store before. So, do, have any of you ever heard of GOG? Yeah. GOG is basically, their big MO is classic games. We're talking like... 80s to 80s and 90s, and maybe even some of the thousands titles. So, games that I grew up playing, like Fallout, Baldur's Gate, um, King's Quest, games that are you probably have never heard of, or you may have seen like a YouTuber cover them at some point. But these are kind of like the big name games of the 90s, and th- they're pretty much like the major way of playing these games legally. Like you don't need to pirate them, you don't need to download like an emulator. They'll sell to you, you can play, you only think you need to use their own storefront, and it's kind of a way of playing these games preserved and available. They're not as big as Steam, but they're still welcoming to independent developers. Then we got some of the competitors. Again, some people try to go for the throne of Steam, and they are Origin and Uplay. They're owned by Electronic Arts and Ubisoft. They're more focused on the bigger games, like AA and AAA, but they're trying, they've been trying for years now to break into that market and it just hasn't worked out well for them. <laughs> but there are some new ones coming out, and this is where things get very interesting for independent developers. I'm sure neither of you have heard of this store before. Yeah, this is itch.io, or they're, I think it's just called, yeah, it's itch.io, but we, most developers call it just itch.io. This is for independent developers entirely. This is kind of like the indie equivalent of, again, like Armored Games, uh, Congregate, stuff like that. So you can put literally any game in any state up on HIO. You set a price, you can even set it for free, and people can play your game. They can rate it. They can give you a donation. You choose how much to give back to the store. And again, it's kind of like independent developers helping independent developers. And because of that, it is open to everybody. It is nowhere near as big as Steam or the App Store or anybody else. But again, if you're literally starting out and you just want to try and put your game up for people to watch, you know, right here will work for you. The Humble Bundle. Have either of you ever heard of the Humble Bundle or have like bought anything from there? 
All right. The Humble Bundle is a weird one. They started out as kind of a charity system where they would have these monthly bundles that you donate, like X amount of dollars will get you different tiers of games, and then proceeds of that will go towards a charity. So they've done stuff for like a Doctors Without Borders, cancer research. Uh, they did one for like when we had, got hit with those hurricanes a few years ago. And basically developers give their games there to try and sanitize the donation. So you could basically buy two to three hundred dollars worth of video games for five cents. It's that crazy with some of the games. And that's how a lot of us basically bought more games than we will ever be able to play. I have over two, I have close to 2,000 games on my Steam list right now from games that I've bought, gone from Humble Bundle, or have been given to me as press keys. Like, that is, like, Twilight Zone level, like, I will never be able to play those games. I will never have the time to do that. But this has been a way, and they've grown to being their own storefront, but it's not the best way to earn money. Because if people are buying your game for five cents, and that five cents is being split seven ways, you're not going to be making a big amount of profit. It's more for like the charity and maybe even the tax write-off than it is about you selling it like that. Now we got the interesting one. So this is how crazy the game industry is. I gave this exact presentation one week ago at uh, the Burlington Library, and they just announced the store that very day. And I was like, eh, I, I'm not going. I don't think I'm going to need to include this in this presentation. It's not going to be that big. And then they got a major announcement on the Game Awards, and developers are now saying they're going to this store instead of Steam. And basically, Epic is leveraging Fortnite in this way to take a stab at Steam and Valve. So the Epic Game Store right now is... Uh oh, well, good thing we're almost done then. <laughs> All right. But good thing we're almost done there. So the Epic Game Store is still in development, but developers are starting to release games on it or saying that their game will be exclusive to it. The big reason why they're being considered popular is that they're only taking, like I said, a 12% cut. And I think if you use the Unreal Engine, they only take 5 or 7%, and that will be included in this as well, so you're not paying double. So they are trying to get more developers to go to them instead of Steam. But, like I said, this was literally announced one week ago, so it's still too soon to be, to be told. But, if they continue to grow, I may be having a bigger part of this presentation in like six months to a year if I give this one again. And, uh, two more sections. So, uh, major conferences. This is where it comes to networking. Getting out there and talking to people, building up uh, people you can talk to who may want to help you with a game or give you guidance. And networking is a big part. This is an industry where everybody kind of knows everybody, especially, excuse me, if you're going to be on the independent side. So, there are a few big trade shows. So, either you know what PAX is, the Penny Arcade Expo. PAX is kind of the consumer show for consumers. Penny Arcade is a popular or it's debatable they're still as popular as they were back like five, ten years ago, webcomic that they kind of blew up, and now they kind of do like charities. They do, they put on this show as a way for consumers to hang out, do uh, meet developers, stuff like that. There's, I think, a PAX East and a PAX West. I think East is in Boston. I don't know where the West one is, but it's basically for everybody. You don't have to be a developer. You don't have to have a, your name in the industry. You can go to the show. Obviously, you have to pay for a ticket, but you can meet developers, try out the latest games, you know, hang out, have a good time. GDC, this is the big one. If you're interested in game development, this is the one you need to know about. This is the Game Developers Conference. This is held once a year. I think right now it's in, a, I think it's a Los, no, San Francisco, California. This is a trade show for people in the industry. So you're not going here to try out the latest games. You're there because you want to learn about, you know, different ways of developing games, different programming skills meeting people who are building games late, uh, daily or for a living. This is like the professional show. It, it's not really open to the consumer. You pretty much are going to go there if you're either in the game industry or you want to get in there. And it can be on the expensive side. But in terms of knowledge, this is pretty much the big one, at least in the United States. 
E3. This is one that pretty much anyone who plays video games has probably heard of at some point. This is the trade show kind of for developers. They put on their yearly shows where they announce all manner of big games. They just had one a few months ago. And this is more for the industry showing itself off. You can still meet people in the game industry. They've recently opened up to the public if you pay for a ticket. But otherwise, this is again for like kind of like the commercial side of things. It's also very expensive, I heard it go. And then I'm gonna move through these last ones very quickly so I know we're running out of time. These are just some additional sites and, addition and places to go to if you wanna start learning about the game industry. The IGDA, this is a good one for starting out. They have chapters in every state. For us in South Jersey, they have a Philadelphia chapter. There's also a Northern New Jersey chapter as well. And this is for like enthusiasts and people to get together, you know, talk about video games, maybe see if you want to collaborate on something, stuff like that. It's the closest we have to some kind of formal organization when it comes to the game industry as of right now. You can sign up for, you can get like a little membership pass that give you like discounts at shows and books. Again, it's kind of like a good way to start meeting people. And you know, if you've never gone to like a meeting of developers or people interested in game design, this is a good way to get started. Gamma Sutra, this is kind of like the official business and industry site, besides stuff like a gameindustry.biz. They allow people to post a, a blogs so of the game industry. I've made multiple posts there, I've gotten mentioned. And they focus again on the industry itself and people in the industry talking about game design and topics. So if you want to know more about the business, this is the site you want to go to. And then books. Everybody loves some books. We're in a library, so I had to put some books on here. These are some of the various books, and there are many more out there that cover a wide range or wide range of game design topics. I own game architecture and design and the theory of fun. I've read rules of play. The Art of Game Design, that lovely little book on the right is my first book that I just got released this past month. And yeah, like I said, there's plenty of books, there's lots of information out there with regards to the game industry. And this is one of my favorites, the GDC Vault. This site keeps the recordings of all the presentations at GDC. So they have talks about, you know, making a roguelike, how to do successful camera techniques, Again, if you're just interested in playing video games, the site will not help you at all. But this is for if you want to start learning more about what goes into the game. They have free and subscription videos. And again, there's more information there that probably most of us will never have the time to watch it all. But it's there if you ever need like some kind of help on a topic when it comes to design. But with that said, to wrap things up, this is an industry about passion. You don't make video games because this was your uh, B job, or you don't wake up going, oh, why do I have to make video games for a living? People get into this because they want to do it. And that drives people to spend two to five years of their life on a title. But if you want to succeed, you have to understand the art as much as the business. I have a friend who gave me this speech that there's as much business in the art as there is art in the business. You have to be able to do marketing just as well as understand what it means to make a good platformer or why people get are so happy about achievements in their games and stuff like that. And again, basic tip, just start learning now. The earlier you do it, it's just going to help you and put you at a leg up compared to people who start learning about the game industry when they're 25, 30, when they're already in college or even after college. And Again, with how fast things are going, it will just make things easier for you all around. But with that said, I know there was a lot here. I kind of sped through with that. <laughs> I want us all to get kicked out. But do you guys have any questions before I end things? Again, there's a lot to talk about. And it's one of the things that you may not think about, but you may have a question. It may just pop into your head later. Mm -hmm. and game maker and RPG maker. Yeah. Can you find those like on mobile? Like is there like RPG they, maker on mobile maybe or 
Now, they do export to mobile. I know Unity has, there's a way to export your project so that it will be friendly on the Google, Google Play or the App Store. But you will probably have to, you will need a computer or a laptop to actually build the game on and then get it translated or export to that platform. And also that little dialogue there, that is like the bane of every game developer of somebody not understanding how games work. Nobody will ever say those lines professionally. But uh, the very last thing is if you would like to follow me, and again, I do want to thank you guys for coming out. I wasn't sure how many people were going to show up. But uh, if you want to follow me, my site, game-wisdom.com, basically I put out posts looking at video games, talking design topics. I have podcasts with game developers where I talk to them about their games they've made. I say podcast a few months ago with a developer out of uh, Jamaica and talk about what it's like to be a game designer in a third world country. My webs, my YouTube channel, I have videos covering games. We have a Discord channel. I have a weekly show where we talk game design topics, stuff like that. You can find me on Twitter there. I have my semi-lovely new business cards I just got printed up that have the website and everything listed here. But that is that. So we're not going to get kicked out of the library, but I think we'll be better to start to get going. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, uh, I hope this helps.